You know, it's been said that there are three things that can take down a pastor or a church. Money, sex, or power. And of course, I'd add to that pride. Especially when we say that we don't have a problem with any of these things to start with. We've all heard in the headlines about the devastating results of a church or a pastor who lost control in one or more of these areas. I'm Steve Schwetz, welcoming you aboard Through the Bible as our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, addresses the deadly issues that crop up in our churches today. We're in 1 Timothy, a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a young pastor. Specifically, Dr. McGee draws out some thought-provoking lessons about leadership in the local church. So grab your Bible and turn to chapter 3, and while you do, I've asked Greg to come in so that we can talk about the Middle East, a place where Through the Bible has significant ministry. We do, Steve. By the grace of God, we are ministering in numerous, all the major languages of the Middle East, Arabic, Turkish, uh, Farsi, which is also referred to as Persian. Uh, you think of uh, Indonesian, you think of which I'm, I'm now actually thinking of the Muslim world, yeah. but, but the Middle East is a very, very surprisingly fruitful yes. field of ministry. Yeah, and I'm excited uh, and I always have a warm spot in my heart for the Middle East because that was the birth of three the Bible on satellite TV. That is correct. Yeah. More than 10 years ago. Yeah. And the success of that starting originally in Arabic and now in multiple languages being dubbed, which I thought I was not a fan of that. Nor was I. I I thought, okay, that's not going to work. And you know what? The team there, because we always partner with local teams, said, no, let us try it. We want to do it. And what was the first? Did they go to Farsi? Was that the first Yeah, Farsi was the first one. Yeah. So they go to Farsi and it worked. Oh, it exploded. And it was successful. Yes. It's been incredibly fruitful. And uh, we have some great responses that we want to share. And keep in mind, we're on Farsi TV, but we also have uh, audio on the internet. I mean, we have many, many ways people can listen to Farsi. Yep, indeed. The first one, here's a letter. This is actually an anonymous letter from the Middle East, and I think it's indicative of a typical listener who has not yet quite made the the public pronouncement yes. of faith in Christ. It says, yeah. Indeed, may God bless you. Such accurate and blessed teachings are never given to anyone for free in any course or college. <laughs> and yet, your programs are. I am still in awe. Thank you for this gift. May the blessing and safety of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and stay forever. Steve, one of the reasons that we're so grateful to our supporting family is they allow us to keep offering this programming over and over and over again for years and even decades in many cases so that a person like this can make that journey that God has them on. Because you're right, it's not clear whether they just admire the program or whether they've put their faith in Christ. Yeah. So here's another one, again, anonymous from the Middle East. Three years ago, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Before that, I used to teach the Quran to children in the mosque. I had a lot of information for Islam. My goal was to spread Islam all around the world. One day, I was listening to you, and the brother was talking very lovingly with others. His talk was nice, and I started to listen to the program regularly. It changed my life, thinking, and behavior. I came to Jesus as a believing man, and now I am Christian and am living a happy life. My future is bright, even if my circumstances are not. Whatever he wants from me, I will do. Thank you for teaching me the eternal words of God. Wow. Wow. That that is just such an encouragement. And again, (laughs) it speaks to, we've talked about this before, how in Dr. McGee's teaching, and it's carried through to these, to the languages when we translate, he doesn't attack other religions. He doesn't go after Islam. He doesn't go after the, you know, the faults that are there in the Quran. He simply teaches the Bible and upholds Jesus Christ. And people are drawn to that. It's, It's incredible. And it's exciting. Yep, here's another one. I am Soraya. I was born in Afghanistan, and then my family moved. I heard about Jesus on your program. It changed me a lot. I have heard about the love of God for his children. Through this program, I grew up in Jesus. I got information about Christianity that God chose us and gives us comfort. Finally, I took a step and confessed my sins, repented, and believed on his name. Now I worship God every day, and he gives me hope of life. (laughs) Man, and Steve, we didn't plan this, but you pointed out that first letter, we weren't sure. The second two letters, we're sure. These people have put their faith in Christ. Yeah, they certainly have. Greg, why don't you pray for us as we begin our program? Father, we recognize that the stories we heard, the testimonies we heard are all because of the power of your word and the power of your Holy Spirit. We're just trying to do what you ask us to do and fling the seed of your word to the world. 
And we know you do all of the real work. And so we thank you for that. And we ask you now, as we dive into your word, that it would do your work in our hearts and make us more like Jesus. And it's in his name we ask. Amen. Here's Dr. J. Vernon McGee with our study of 1 Timothy 3 on Through the Bible. Now, friends, today we return back to the third chapter of 1 Timothy, and here we are seeing something of what would be called church government, the officers in the church. Last time we saw the requirements for elders or bishops in the church. And now we come to the requirements of deacons in the church. And again, the word that is used for deacon is a word, actually, it's translated minister. Paul and Apollos are called deacons. We find that the Lord Jesus is called a minister in Galatians 2.17. Government officials are called ministers and that's in Romans 13, 4. And then ministers of Satan are called ministers, 2 Corinthians 11, 15. You see, it's a general term for a servant and a worker. And the very interesting thing in what we think is the place where the office of deacon began in the sixth chapter of Acts, the word deacon is not even used there, or the word for it. But I'm confident, and I think we have scriptural ground for it, that these were deacons that were appointed in the church. And a deacon, although he had to do with the material things of the church, that did not mean that he should not be a spiritual man. Because the great problem today is that we often put a man in an office in the church who has certain physical qualifications, but he has no spiritual qualifications. That is, if he has physical qualifications, he's been a successful businessman. He knows how to conduct business. And we think because he is able to do that, that he'd make a good deacon. And unfortunately, there are a men that are appointed to office on that basis. And the one thing that we've tried to emphasize in 1 Timothy, and we would mention it again, is the fact that though the church is a local organization and it has to manifest itself in a community, it gets right down where the rubber meets the road. And they have to have a building. They have to have heat and lights and a lot of these material things that don't seem very romantic or don't seem very religious. But the important thing is that it is the spiritual qualifications that that local church has a spiritual ministry, and these men that are in office must have that. And we think today that these material qualifications must come first. Someone has put it like this. When a church ceases to be in touch with another world, she is no longer in touch with this one. And I agree with that 100%. Until the spiritual is emphasized, the church cannot do that which is material or that which is practical down here. Therefore, the deacons here, there are certain spiritual qualifications. Now, I go over this again. In like manner, must the deacons be grave. Now I'm reading 1 Timothy 3, verse 8. They must, first of all, be grave. And that, we said last time, that means they're to keep their cool and not double tongue. That means they're not to be two-faced. They must be man whose word amounts to something and not given to much wine. As we said before, the Bible teaches temperance, not total abstinence. Now, in that day, this would not have been a problem. Today, it is a problem. And I think today the church should teach total abstinence in view of the fact the way that alcohol is used and abused today. And the only way it can be used would be, of course, in the place, as we said last time, of medicine. I think it should not for the Christian be a refreshment or a drink. 
and not greedy of filthy lucre. And that means having an insatiable love of money. And the suggestion here is that the man who handled the money of the church should be honest, man of integrity. And may I say that there's nothing that'll hurt a church more than for word to get out that the deacons are juggling the finances, that money given to one cause doesn't go for that cause, and that money is being used in a way that it was not intended to be used, and they do not handle it in an honest way. We have discovered, I have as a minister and in radio, that for the most part, and I can say that as far as I know churches that 99 and 44 one hundredths percent of them are run by men of high integrity. But you know that little 44 one hundredths percent, they are the ones that are muddy in the water today and are causing a great deal of difficulty. I very candidly have to say today that there are a few churches and a few Christian organizations I cannot nor will I recommend at all because I do know that the finances are not helped in an honest way. And the thing that the church, that local church, that's right down, you see, where it has to get into shoe leather. If there's one thing it should present to the world, it is the fact that it is honest and that it is a place of high integrity in financial matters. Now, will you notice here He says in verse 9, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Now, the mystery of the faith means the revelation of the gospel in Christ. You see, the faith is not the abstract quality of faith, but it is the doctrines of the faith. And these doctrines were not revealed in the Old Testament. They are a mystery because they're now revealed in the New Testament. And we're told that the early church, they continued in the apostles' doctrine. That was the faith of the early church. It should be the faith of the church today. And it should, before the world, represent that faith. Now, there are a great many think it's outmoded, that it should be changed. And I noticed that there was a change of seven deadly sins, as they were called, that have been brought up to date. And this was an editorial that appeared in Life magazine years ago. And I'm just going to quote part of it. It says, judging by the amount of deploring, they now receive a current list of the seven deadly sins would go like this. And now they list the new seven deadly ones selfishness, intolerance, indifference, cruelty, violence, destructiveness, and replacing lust, of course, prudery. Now, most of the deletions are self-evident. Lust, for instance, has become as commonplace as the neighborhood newsstand or a cinema. Gluttony may sometimes give a man a cholesterol problem, but not much of a theological one. And words like covetousness and sloth simply seem antiquated. As for the additions, we have omitted new sins that appeal only to one segment of the population, such as irrelevance, which would probably head the sin list of the young. Some of the young would probably also object to including violence on the list. This minority is welcome to substitute another sin of its choice, such as hypocrisy, There should be no youthful objections to inclusion of destructiveness in as far as it means destruction of the environment. Old people might hope for hair, noise, and incivility. It will be argued, no doubt, that our revised list of deadly sins actually perpetuates several of the old standbys under new names, selfishness for covetousness, for instance, Maybe so, but the old names are obsolescent and need changing if sin itself is to retain any contemporary 
moral force at all. After all, sin is a concept well worth saving. Well, I should say it is, but it hasn't changed. But sin is still sin. Human nature is still human nature. And these requirements today that are put down for these men hold good today if the church is to represent the Lord Jesus Christ here on this earth. And if it is to be a church in the community, it is to hold to, as the officer should hold to, the mystery of the faith. That is the New Testament doctrine and that sin is sin and these sins can be labeled and they're labeled very clearly in the Word of God. Now, let's move on. And this is to be held, of course, in pure conscience. Not a conscience, as we'll see in the next chapter, seared with a hot iron. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. In other words, a man should not be shoved into that office the next month after he joins the church and before it's proven that he is the type of man that the Scripture outlines here. Now there's a word here for the wives, not only for the man, but also for the wives. And wives of deacons must measure up to certain standards. Now, let me read at verse 11. Even so must their wives be grave. That is, they should be serious. They should be able to be calm and cool and not slanderers. That means they're not to be gossips. A gossipy wife of a deacon can cause a great deal of trouble in the church, and then sober, sober sober-minded, and faithful in all things. That is, faithful to her husband, and faithful, of course, to the cause of Christ, and to Christ himself. Now he goes on here, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. That's the same rule for the elders, ruling their children and their own houses well. They have certain personal requirements, and certain family requirements, you see. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, a deacon who serves well will become a man to be trusted. And boldness here is confidence and courage in witnessing. That is, he has a spiritual office primarily. And that is very difficult to get over to the deacons. I remember one man that was a deacon was asked to serve as an elder. Oh, he says, I don't think I'm spiritual enough or I know enough about the Bible. The fact of the matter is that same confession that he made that he couldn't be an elder should have been used to keep him from being a deacon, but it apparently didn't because he was a successful businessman And I never felt that he was a very good deacon, although that he was a very successful businessman. Someone has said, when is a businessman not a businessman? And that's when he's a church officer. And I think there's some truth to that. Why? Because of the spiritual requirements and that they have not attained to that level that should represent the church, you see. Now, Paul goes on to say here, Verse 14 now of 1 Timothy 3, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. You see, Paul was in prison hoping to be out of prison. And if he was out of prison, it was after his first imprisonment, and he hoped to join Timothy. Paul was in Macedonia, and Timothy was in Ephesus. Now, verse 15 He says, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, this is a very important verse. I gave this as the key to the epistle. I think this letter here would be a book of church order for the local church in the absence of Paul, you see. He says, I've written this to you so you'll know how to act 
And he says, in the church of the living God, the church that is the church, and the pillar and the ground of the truth. Now, this is, may I say, I think a very interesting expression here, the pillar and ground of the truth. The word pillar here, actually, it means the stay and the prop of the church. And the word for pillar here is that which is foundational. So if I may translate it here, because the idea is that the church is the pillar, it's the bedrock, and as such, it is the prop or support of the truth. In other words, if the officers do not represent the truth, then the church has no foundation at all. It has no prop at all. It can't hold up the truth of God. And I don't care how much they talk about that they do hold the truth. I knew a man once. He was a deacon. He carried a Bible, the biggest Bible I think I've ever seen. When he came in, he was always weighted down on one side, but he was a man that you couldn't depend on. Actually, there was some question about the man's integrity. And he hurt the church. He absolutely hurt the church and brought it into disrepute. Therefore, the whole point Paul is making here, I want you to know how to act in the church, not manners, but how your life is to be so that when you're outside, that you are part of the prop of the truth. You represent the truth. Oh, that's so important. Now, verse 16 And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the nations, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now, actually, this probably was one of the earliest creeds of the church. Some think that it was one of the songs of the early church. Without controversy, we are told here, And that's a very interesting word that we have here. Without controversy means confessedly or obviously. And notice this, that great is the mystery of godliness. Now, that is that God is going to bring into this world in which we live. He's going to remove sin and going to bring in godly men and godly women. Now, God was manifest in the flesh. That certainly is the virgin birth. And also, we're told he was justified in the Spirit. Now, I don't have time to develop this, but here's something for you to study. He was manifest in the flesh. He was humiliated in the flesh, died in the flesh. But you see, justified in the Spirit, sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body, and no enemy laid a hand on him after he was raised from the dead. He was justified in the Spirit. He was delivered for our offenses, raised for our justification, for our righteousness today. He was seen of angels. He was when he was here. He didn't see angels. They saw him. And today, he's gone back. And I'm of the opinion all of the created intelligences of heaven worship him. Why? Because he came down and wrought redemption for mankind today. And the little man down here hasn't caught on yet that this is going to be the song of eternity, the song of redemption. Now he's preached unto the nations. That's what we're doing today. That's true. And believed on in the world. There are many today that are trusting him as their Savior and received up into glory. And he's at God's right hand. In fact, at this very moment, He's right up there, friends. By the way, have you had anything to say to him today? Have you talked with him? Have you told him that you love him? Have you thanked him for something? How wonderful he is. We leave off there and pick up a chapter four next time. May God richly bless you, my beloved. Well, have you? Have you told him how much you love him and thanked him for all that he's done for you? Why don't you take some time to do that today? 
And if you'd like to share how he's working in your life as we study his word together, you know we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at biblebus at ttb.org, or you can leave a message anytime at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Well, we got more of this incredible study of First Timothy. I'm Steve Schwetz inviting you to hop aboard as the Bible bus rolls along. It's always better when you're on board. Jesus came home, home to be my home. Sin had left a crimson Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?